Preston King Dorsey Center on 23. They're really the damn area. All right, we got it. But uh, that's Tuesday. And uh, calling hours are just before the week. 11 to 2 for the calling hours. Okay. Anybody else have anything you'd like to share with us this morning? <coughs> Brother Bob is not here because Sister Barb is in the hospital. She fell and bumped her head, bumped the back of her head, got up, and a few minutes later she fell and bumped the front of her head. So she's in the hospital getting checked out. Okay. Anybody else have anything you'd like to share with us? If not, Sister Diane, would you stand and ask God's blessing on our service? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for letting us come into this building to hear the message today, the privilege of just being here and being safe and being allowed to pray dear God. Please bless the message that we're about to hear. May we take it with us in our heart through Jesus Christ. Amen.
family members were over the area in his hill. Remember Sister Rosie and her family. Remember Brother Randy and Sister Paul. Remember Marie and her help Remember Brother Gene and his help Remember Sister Judy and her help Remember Sister Ollie and Aunt Dorothy. Remember Sister Donna Williams. Remember Sister Julie still needs our prayers. Remember Dave Swinger and his recovery. Brandon and Amanda have a marriage problem. Remember Jenny and Witt recovering from the car accident. Linda Parks, stage four cancer needs prayer. Remember Sister Lori Brother of Backstreet. Remember Lori's sister Linda. Remember Sister Aunt Joanne Beers. Anybody else? Uh, it has its joys. Uh, when 
I was 35 years old, if I wanted to check on Friday, I had to get up Monday through Friday and work. And then the next week I got that check. Now, uh, the check just automatically is deposited in the checking account. Not enough there, never is, never will be, but I, I get that little donation from uh, the fund at uh, Washington, D.C. that I deposited money in every week for, I don't know how many years, a whole bunch of years. I had to stop down and up, there's a bunch. But uh, it's fun getting that little donation. That's one of the uh, better parts of growing old. Some of the other parts of growing old is you bite into an apple and you and you, you wonder when the taste is going to come. Uh, you, you, can, you have to eat tasty food when you get old because that bland food that you used to really like, there's, there's no taste there. It's gone. It's forgotten. So you see lots of chili powder and you need lots of black pepper and lots of garlic honey and all that good things. Helps you right out. Part of it, it's all part of the thing about getting old. Balance is just a part of it. Somebody this morning want to thank God for the blessing that of getting old or staying young or whatever. Uh, somebody want to just praise the Lord this morning. Somebody else want to brag on the Lord this morning. Somebody got a song. message. Um, as your pastor, I would like for you to remember me today. I was uh, looking on the calendar the other day and uh, I realized, Sister Pam, that today is the 75th anniversary, I guess is not the right word, but you understand what I'm talking about. 75 years ago today, my oldest sister, she was two years younger than me. She was born in August and she died, Sister Judy, of pneumonia. That old raggedy farmhouse we were living in in Carter County, Kentucky, you couldn't keep the place warm. There were just too many people in there to whatever. She got pneumonia and uh, died there. They took her up on the hill and buried her up by my grandfather. And uh, life went on. My stepdad and my mother came back up to Columbus. And a year later, 74 years later, on the exact day, one year later, Sandra's death, Sharon was born. Mom said when Sharon was born, she knew without a doubt she would never raise a girl. She said, I didn't know why. I just knew I never would. And 21 months later, a drunk driving a car murdered my baby sister. So today is not one of those rejoicing days. I don't like to see November 7th come every year, but it does. The memories come. But you know, Sister Linda was talking earlier about Sister Rosie walking the streets of glory. They met. <laughs> My sisters and Sister Rosie have met. They have become friends. I don't know, that's maybe the wrong way to say it, but you understand what I'm saying. And I'm going to do my best. I'm going to make sure if there's any way possible, Brother Jim, I get to be with them through <laughs> among others. But uh, just wanted to ask you to uh, remember us in prayer today. Um, it's a hard day in a way. It's a happy day in other ways. But I just need your prayer, okay? In our message last week, we spoke of some of the things that will be visible uh, to all of the earth just before and during the return of Jesus Christ for his church. The disciple John wrote about those in the book of Mark. If you 
Then, if you weren't here last week, you can look those up in Mark chapter 13. There were a number of things there that he was given by God to write down. It was inspired for him to write it down so that we would know. One of those things, of course, is the sun is going to go dark. The moon will not give its light. And that will happen before Jesus comes back. There are a lot of people that say, well, you know, I'm not sure that's true. Well, go read the book of Mark. Mark 13 especially. He says it without a doubt. There's absolutely no doubt that the sun's going to go dark. The moon's not going to give us light. And then, a little bit later, Jesus is going to come back. But uh, years later, after Mark wrote that, Paul was writing a letter to Timothy. And when he wrote that letter, he warned Timothy of some problems that would be seen also. What Mark wrote about were problems that would be seen on the earth, earthly problems, physical problems that entail the earth itself. What Paul wrote to Timothy about was not the earth itself. He wrote about the people that would be here. And he started out with this. He said, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Would you bow your heads? Our precious and most kind Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all of your many blessings. Thank you most importantly for your Son, Jesus Christ, and for what he means to us. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of being able to read your word and understand your word. We thank you for those uh, warnings that you gave us of the physical things that will happen to this earth and the surrounding areas, as well as the things that will be involved by the people here. Things that we should look for, watch for, things that we should be careful to avoid. We thank you and praise you for it all in Jesus' wondrous name they all said. Amen. Amen. Paul did not say that times would be bad. He didn't use that word bad times. The word that he used up there is perilous. Per if, you, if, you, if you had a ladder of understanding, uh, somewhere down at the bottom, just off the floor, would be ugly times, and then something a little bit worse, and then finally you'd get up a little bit farther on that step, there would be bad times, and then there would be worse times, and then there would be mean times, and then fierce times, Somewhere up there, farther away, is that word perilous. Perilous means absolute, imminent danger. Uh, how many of you were down in Kentucky or West Virginia or someplace like that and you walked across a creek on a rope bridge? You ever tried that? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't mind walking across a creek on a rope bridge, but if I look down and I see that rope and that rope's really badly frayed, Brother Charlie, I'm going to wade the creek. <laughs> I don't want to fall down in the head first. You know, I'll, I'll wade the creek first. But uh, that would be something perilous, especially if you're up 30, 40 feet off the ground and that rope breaks. Well, I'm not sure I could. I know it's 76 years old. I'm not going to be able to hand over hand go all the way across through there. I just know, Brother Jim, I'm fixing to get right real good and wet. I hope them rocks are soft down there. <laughs> you know, uh, perilous would be driving down Interstate 71 and you looked up and you saw <clears throat> an overpass with concrete pieces falling off of it. And you know you have to get to the other side of that. That would be perilous driving underneath that. Uh, perilous, again, is serious, imminent danger uh, with the possibility of being hurt or the possibility of being, being killed. And Paul was inspired by God to write about the men that God showed him that would be here in, the, in these days. And it was the men and the women and their actions and their way of living that was what he was talking about that he called it perilous. Uh, today we can see many of these things uh, apparent, especially in our political leaders and even in some local people. But today, 
we want to look at them and take a big, long look, not at the people out there who are displaying these things, but to like, take a big, long look at ourselves and make sure that we're not displaying some of these sorts of things. Paul went on to write this. He said, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, and unholy. That's a long list, Brother Jim, of things that uh, are not good at all. And it's easy. It's easy to fall into any one of these, uh, and I don't use this term, this personal pit of evil. Uh, and once you fall in, it's easy to climb out wearing the dirt from one of these personal pits of evil. Now, Jesus did teach us, absolutely, he did. He taught us that we should love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And the reason behind that was we can't really love someone else if we're angry with ourselves. Our attitude will, will, will just, just won't allow that to happen. So you've got to start by loving yourself. But when Paul was talking about this up here, he was talking about people who love themselves to the point that they did not see others. They love themselves above others. And if you go into the book of Daniel, uh, go into uh, the book of Matthew, and see where the description is of the beast and the false prophet, I believe it's also in uh, 2 Timothy, talks about this man that is going to come out one of these days. He's going to be a world ruler. He will not have a girlfriend. He will not have a boyfriend. He will be so in love with himself that he will not have a close companion at all. He will use people for his personal agenda. I think that's the right word. He will use people for his personal agenda, but he will not have that close relationship that uh, someone has, Diane has, for example, with her granddaughter there. Her granddaughter was just tickled pink to come to the church with Mamma today. And we're glad to see those kinds of relationships. But these people here, these people here don't have those relationships. They've never gotten to the point to where they love someone else as much as they love themselves. And we, we have to get there. Because if we don't, we'll wind up getting into this garbage right here. And then Paul went on to talk about this. <clears throat> he said those people would be without natural affection. Again, they don't love anyone else because they love themselves. They would be truce breakers. Anyone here ever had a friend? You had a you, you decided together you wanted to do something, and when it came time to do it, well, they went off some other direction, and you were stuck with it. Uh, those are truce breakers, false accusers. How many of you here, somewhere along in your lifetime, somebody accused you of something falsely? You did not do it, but they stood right there and said, "Yes, sir, she or he did. I saw them do it. I know they did it. That's part of it." If you're going to accuse somebody, have some kind of evidence, uh, you know, to make sure that whatever you're accusing them of is true. Incontinent. <clears throat> incontinent. A person who is incontinent cannot uh, stay focused on any one thing. They, they get over here, they work a little bit on this, and then they drop that, and they grab over here, and they work on this a little bit, they drop that, and they go over here, and they do something else, and they drop that. You, you can never get them to do anything and get it completed. And then, of course, it's Jim's fault that it didn't get completed. That's always the way it works. Fierce. We've met fierce people. Ugly, sorry people. All they want to do is complain and, and accuse and, and beat on people. And then if he finishes up there with despisers of those that are good. 
despisers of those that are good. There are a lot of good people out there. Some of them are in government. I have to admit, there's fewer in government than there are any place else. But there are a lot of good people out there. There are a lot of good sheriffs, for example. We've had a lot of uh, nasty stuff going on about trying to defund the police departments and shut them down and rebuild them some other way. There's a sheriff down in Florida. Uh, one of his sheriff deputies got shot and killed. And they went after the man that uh, had shot their deputy. They got him cornered, and they told him to come out with his hands up, to uh, turn it, you know, throw his gun out, and come out with his hands up. He came out with that gun in his hand, and he started shooting at him. They started shooting back. When they got done shooting back, I think they had shot him something like 67 times. I'm not sure the exact number. When one of the reporters later that day asked him, Sheriff, just why did your deputy shoot him 67 times? And he said, anytime somebody shoots at one of my men, they are shooting at our entire government, they're shooting at everybody else, they are trying to destroy our country. He said, when they shoot at us, we're going to shoot back. And all you bad guys out there, remember that. We're going to shoot back. The reporter kind of left and didn't say anything more. <laughs> but uh, those are people that are despisers of things that are good. That reporter wanted to destroy that sheriff's uh, statement, uh, whatever you want to call that. He wanted, he wanted to put the sheriff in a bad light because the sheriff and his buddies or the sheriff and his deputies had killed this guy. Well, you know, if you, when you point a gun at somebody that's got a gun and you tell them you're going to shoot them, well, you might get shot yourself. Just be careful uh, in, that, in, that, in that way. But this verse goes on to describe many of the people that we see every day in the news. Uh, they have no natural affection. They're truth breakers. They're false accusers and so forth. Uh, we see them in the news by their actions and by their attitudes. Again, going back to Mark, talk, talk to us about things that we would see in the development of the earth and things of that nature. Paul here is talking about people themselves and the things that they're doing. And um, some of these people are, we see on the news because of their actions themselves. And then some of the things that we see, Brother Charlie, on the news is not because of what they did. It's the way the newscasters turn whatever was done. So sometimes it's the people making the news, and sometimes it's the people reporting the news. But you need to look carefully at what is said and what is done there to make a proper decision. And again, the big one of all of those is those that... Uh, despise those that are good. And we get down to the church. The church today is under attack almost worse than it has ever been. And it seems to get a little bit worse uh, seemingly every day or every week or every month. It seems like the church is on public trial. People want to shut down the church. Uh, they 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 want to get rid of it. There is a movement. There always is. I mean, it, it's one of those things that happens uh, every year when we have new people elected. Uh, one of the things that they do when they get to Washington, some of them, is they start talking about wanting to tax the church. I don't care if they tax the church. I'm, I don't really want it to happen. But I'm willing to pay my fair share. I'm willing to help out. But when you get some of them talking about how they want to tax the church, we're talking about 50%. Today, it was $668 uh, turned in. They want 334 of it. And they want me to send it by Monday afternoon. Send it on you know, electronic so they get it right away. Uh, 
These people are despisers of things that are good. They want to shut us down by taking our money away from us. They want to shut us down by putting in zoning places so that you can only have so many churches in, so, in such a square footage or square mile area. You can't have any more than that. And you can't have any more than a certain number of people in the church. They talked about all of these things. The church is on public trial. The church is on public trial by the Muslims. Obviously, you never <clears throat> hear uh, anybody, at least in the last few weeks, few months, you never hear of anybody here in the United States, a Muslim that does anything wrong. But you can hear about the Catholic priest that did something wrong. You can hear about the Protestant uh, pastor that did something wrong. All of those things make the news, but Funny, but again, Muslims just don't seem to make the news. But then, again, they promised that if they ever get the chance, everyone must be dead. I don't ever remember a Christian saying that. I don't remember any Christian, Sister Linda, saying, you know what we ought to do? We ought to just go kill every Muslim there is. And then pass out medals to the ones that did it. The Muslims will do that to kill Christians. The Muslims will do that to kill Jews. They have a, a murderous spirit as part of their society, as part of their religion. But they despise those that are good, uh, along with politicians and so forth. And there's another group that despise the church. Uh, it's the ones that are too lazy to work and too nervous to steal. They despise the church because the church won't pay their bills. They despise the church. You know, it's really funny when you see this person talking on a $500 cell phone, drinking a $6 cup of coffee, wearing a $200 pair of tennis shoes, and complaining about how bad capitalism is. Then they go get in their Corvette and drive away. Yeah. Capitalism and Christianity is bad stuff. Funny thing is, capitalism and Christianity is what built the United States of America. You can take you, you can say it's a lot of other things, but capitalism and Christianity is what built the United States, and that's all there is to it. I can take you back historically, I can prove that without absolutely any doubt at all. But they also complain that the church is not doing enough to help poor people. <clears throat> They're not feeding them enough, they're not paying their bills for them. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just plain disgusting when I hear these people and the, and the way they go on. But then, Paul went on a little bit further. He said, they're traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And there we find all too many who are in what is called the church. They're not truly a part of the church, uh, Church of God, but they attend the services, and when they walk out the back door, they walk out with a fistful of complaints. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And sometimes they attempt to take over. They attempt to take over the church. Uh, I suppose most of us, somewhere along the line, have heard, seen, or having absolutely witnessed that sort of thing occurring. Uh, my wife and I used to go to a church that uh, was taken over by a couple of people who had a particular doctrine they wanted to teach. And uh, they were not going to let anybody else say anything. It was their doctrine. That was it. That's all it was to it. And uh, we have since gone to that building, the building the church itself, the congregation, finally, one at a time, left, just like we did. We're not listening to that garbage. We're gone. We left. Others followed us. One day, there wasn't enough to hold service. The next day, there wasn't enough to pay the electric bill. And so finally, they had to close down. They closed down. Somebody else bought the building. And my wife and I were down there one time with the new group that's in the building, praising the Lord, worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth like they should. But that first group uh, just wanted to have the preeminence. They wanted to be the ones that were telling everybody else this is the only way to get to heaven. I'm sorry. 
that was just one way, and I'm not so sure that it was a way. But uh, he again goes on a little bit further, and he says this. He says, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And he says, from such, turn away. Now, let's back up. I've talked about these people uh, here for the last uh, 15 minutes, 18 minutes, something like that. And what I really wanted to get to this morning was not so much those people, but rather getting to a mirror for each one of us. Taking these scriptures, walking up, looking in the mirror, and making sure, Sister Menda, that none of them describes us. A solid, born-again, bought by the blood of Jesus Christian should never have any of these things as a descriptor or as an adjective describing them. We should, we should free ourselves and make certain that we are not part of this. Especially this part here, having a form of godliness, the nine power thereof. Paul talked about them. He described them having this form of godliness. We've all met somewhere along the line. We're, we're adults. We've been around the, you know, we've been around the corner and back, or down the street and back. We have met people who talked about being a Christian, uh, talked about being saved, talked about going to heaven. And then you turn around and you look at what they do and you say, well, I hope they change the ways because what they're doing, they're not going to get there. They have a form of godliness. That's all it is. But you see, they deny the power of godliness. And what is the power of godliness, Brother White? Well, part of the power of godliness is being such a person that God hears your prayer and looks at one of the angels and says, fix that. Fix it now. Any way you can, get it done. That's a godly person. I'll give you one example. Her name was Mina Webb. She was my grandmother. My grandmother could not go to Vietnam and carry a shield and, carry, and walk around behind me or beside me and make sure I didn't get shot. But let me tell you what my grandmother could do. She could lay on that bed every night, Brother Jim, and say, Lord God, in heaven above, my grandson's in Vietnam. I can't protect him, but you can bring him home safe and sound. He did. You, sh you should have seen the smile on that woman's face when I got back for the last time, I was out of the Navy, it was over with, it was done, I was a civilian, and I come walking in and I said, hi, Granny. Uh, her face was only about that wide, but the smile went out to about here, if you know what I mean. Her prayers had been answered because she was a godly person. Uh, her prayers, uh, just for to give you another example, when her husband died in 1938, she had a little old ramshackle farm. Couldn't really call it much of that. It was all hillsides. There was a little bottom down there. You had a little bottom, bottom ground that's about twice the size of this church property here. That's where Grandpa raised all of the food and so forth that fed his family and himself. When Grandpa died, Grandma had that and the, the clothes on her back. Was about it. She didn't have a car. Uh, she had a couple of mules and a horse. And uh, God took care of her from 1938 until 1981. She finally passed away in 1981. She never starved. She never had. In fact, the map is after she passed away, we all looked in the closet in there and there was dresses and dresses and dresses and suits and skirts and tops and dresses and coats and suits and skirts and tops enough there to clothe a small army if they were all her size. Her children, the grandchildren made sure she had clothing, made sure she had food, made sure she had a place to stay. She never had to worry about it. Why? Because she was a godly person. Godliness will get your prayer answered. Godliness will also show your sons, your daughters, your grandsons, your granddaughters, your nieces, your nephews, your friends, your neighbors, will show all of them 
how to live. Godliness will give them the opportunity to see what God wants out of a human being. And if you live that godly life, you give the example to them, and they will then hopefully pick it up and take it to their children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews, and so forth. Uh, there's tons and tons of people who have that, what do you want to call it, testimony. They have that testimony that grandma was you know, a good old Christian and go down the line. I look back in my family, my great-grandfather was a Methodist uh, Sunday school teacher. Uh, my grandfather was an old Baptist preacher. I've got an uncle who was an old Baptist preacher. I've got another uncle that taught Sunday school for years on end in Shawano, Wisconsin. Uh, you know, when you, when you look and see at the godliness that was portrayed in front of them, it brought out later on in life, the godliness in them. And that's one of the things that, you know, we have to have. This, this, this group of people here that Paul was talking about, they only have a form of it. They don't have the godliness. And they deny the power that's there. Godliness will also cause people to respect you, uh, even if they don't like you. They will respect you just simply because of the fortitude that you put forth to let people know what you believe in. Let people know what you, you have gotten a hold of in, in your belief and in your actions. And the good part, when we talked about looking in that mirror to make sure that none of this stuff is a part of our actions, is, is, is not, not a part of our attire. <clears throat> when we do that, we may get down one of these days to a point to where one of those people that don't like you, one of those people that doesn't want to be around you, but one of those people that does recognize and appreciates your belief, they may stop just for a moment. And if they stop for just a moment and think about how they're living, they may change. You say, now, Brother White, Give me an example of that. <laughs> I need mean, the best example I know. December 25th, 1977. There was a fellow up there preaching, playing on a guitar. When I first met him, when I first looked at him, I kind of thought, well, he's kind of showing off up there, him and his guitar. Kind of showing off with his singing. Kind of showing off with the way he's acting. Before the night was over with Brother Jim, <laughs> I was doing my best to show off just like him. Because I respected what Brother Kermit Richmond was presenting. I respected what he stood for. I respected the way that he presented the gospel of Jesus Christ. And before the night was over with, I was born again a Christian. I wasn't when I went there that, that evening. I went, I'll tell you the truth, I went there to get warm. I had been working all day out at her mom's place in a t-shirt and pair of blue jeans and tennis shoes, uh, working on some closets, in and out, cutting a piece of wood, bringing it in, nail up the place, go out, cut another piece. It was cold out there, but if I put a shirt on, I was sweating so bad that I I didn't need that shirt. All I needed was that t-shirt. It was in and out, in and out, in and out. Finally, it got dark. <clears throat> and uh, everybody was talking about going to church. I went out there to cut that last piece of pan with Brother Jim, and it was some kind of cold out there. Linda came in, and she says, now, white. She says, here's you a pot of coffee. I said, right here on the wood stove, right next to the pipe. It'll keep it warm for you while we're gone. That was a straw that broke the camel's back. I went and got my plaid pants, my polka dot shirt, my cowboy boots with that ooh, big long tip pointed boots on, them brown boots that I shined up really good. And I put on my brown dress and I went in there and I slicked my hair back. I said, y'all going to church, I'm going with you. And I did. I went with an attitude of maybe showing off a little bit, Brother Jim. An attitude of Staying warm for the night. But I respected 
And that's, that's the word. I respected that minister enough to listen to him for just a minute. And at the end of that just a minute, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. This is, this is what you've got to do, friends. You've got to make sure that all of these things that Paul talked about are not a part of your personality, not a part of your daily walk out through this world. And if you do that, you may not see somebody come to you and say, uh, Sister Linda, I got saved because of you. But they just might. And even if we don't get the testimony, it doesn't make a dime a little difference. It's the soul that's saved that counts. It's not the testimony and the number we see. Okay? But uh, that would be the greatest gift you could possibly give yourself. That's the greatest gift you could probably re you could possibly receive from being a godly person is to see that that godliness you portrayed saw a soul saved, a life changed, and a heart changed. That is the most wonderful thing that could possibly ever happen. Uh, when we think about Sister Rosie, I, uh, I would wonder, I know it's a big number, I would wonder how many heard her Sunday school lessons. How many of them looked at the woman that she was and listened to the testimony that she gave. And I wonder how many of them said, you know, I think I want to be like that. That's, that's what it's all about. That's, that makes it all worthwhile to see a soul saved, a life changed, or a heart changed. Well, this morning, I don't know what might be on your heart, what might be on your mind. Perhaps someone here this morning has a reason you would like to come and pray. Sister Wendy comes. She's going to sing page 81. She's going to have to sing it as we walk out the pool code because we wouldn't have a piano player this morning. But... Uh, as we all stand this morning, perhaps this morning somebody has a reason you'd like to pray. If you have a reason or a need for prayer, we would love for you to just come and take us by the hand. Take us by the hand and we'll go to prayer together. Sister Linda, go ahead. Just Is there one this morning ever say, Brother White, take me by the hand? Or perhaps you don't want to take me by the hand.
you dismiss this assembly in word of prayer, please? Dear Lord, as we bow our heads before you, be with us as we each go our own way. Keep us safe. Be with those that are unable to come and put your hand on each one. And be with all of us because we are Christians. We pray this in your name to Jesus. Amen. Also, the Veterans Parade is today in Delaware. Oh,